And the facts are these. I didn't, I didn't choose this position. I didn't want it. But God chose us for his own reasons. But I need your help. You're listening, ladies and gentlemen, to the hour of the time. Sorry we got on here a little bit late, but uh, I'm having some problems with some of this. Some of this equipment and while I spend a couple of seconds here trying to adjust it so that I can tell what in the world it is that I'm doing there that sounds good then we can get on with the broadcast tonight ladies and gentlemen what you're going to hear is something that no one has heard the intelligence community has been well insulated from the American people for many years and uh, there is one specific organization that up until recently nobody even ever heard of much less knows anything about we assigned a special team of intelligence service operatives to collect information another team to collate that information and analyze it and another team to take that data and put it in to the form of a report. Beginning tonight, I am going to give you what nobody wants you to know, and it's going to take several evenings. I suggest that if you are a person who is interested in the intelligence community or in this type of research, that you have a pad and pen near your side and that you take copious notes because you will not ever get this from the Encyclopedia Britannica or from the World Almanac or from anywhere else for that matter. So ladies and gentlemen, settle in and get ready because <laughs> I'm going to pull the curtain up on the National Security Agency. gentlemen after you hear this report that I'm going to convey to you tonight collected analyzed compiled by the intelligence service of the Second Continental Army of the Republic 
You will know more about the National Security Agency than you will ever know about the Intelligence Service or the Second Continental Army of the Republic, I can assure you. The National Security Agency, also known as the NSA, is the nation's cryptologic organization. It is tasked with making and breaking codes and the ciphers and has as well many other tasks. To break codes and ciphers, they must be able to intercept messages and communications, which means that the major task of the National Security Agency is to monitor all communications by all means worldwide, specifically electromagnetic emissions in all spectrums. The National Security Agency is one of the most important centers of foreign language analysis and research and development within the United States government. It is a high technology organization working on the very frontiers of communications, data processing, and uh, electronic equipment. The expertise and knowledge it develops provide the government with systems that deny foreign powers knowledge of the United States capabilities and intentions. The National Security Agency is charged with two of the most important and sensitive activities in the United States intelligence community. The Information Systems Security, also known as InfoSec mission, provides leadership, products, and services to protect classified and unclassified national security systems against exploitation through interception, unauthorized access, or related technical intelligence threats. This mission, ladies and gentlemen, also supports the Director, National Security Agency, in fulfilling responsibilities as executive agent for intra-agency operations security training. The Foreign Signals Intelligence, or SIGINT, spelled S-I-G-I-N-T, mission, allows for an effective unified organization and consists of all the foreign signals collection and processing activities of the United States. The NSA is authorized to produce SIGINT in accordance with objectives, requirements, and priorities which are established by the director of the Central Intelligence Agency with the advice of the National Foreign Intelligence Board. Although code making and breaking are ancient practices, ladies and gentlemen, modern cryptologic communications intelligence activities in the United States date from the World War I period and radio communications technology. In 1917 and 1918, the United States Army created within the Military Intelligence Division the Cipher Bureau, known as MI-8, under Herbert O. Yardley. MID assisted the radio intelligence units in the American Expeditionary Forces, and in 1918 created the Radio Intelligence Service for operations along the Mexican border. The Navy had established a modest effort, but it was absorbed by mutual agreement in 1918 into Yardley's post-war civilian, quote, black chamber, end quote. The Army and the State Department continued to support Yardley until the termination of his black chamber in 1929. Army continuity was assumed, however, in the small signal intelligence service of the Army Signal Corps, under the direction of William F. Friedman. The Navy's cryptanalytic function reappeared formally in 1924 in the research desk under Commander Lawrence F. Safford in the Code and Signal Section, OP-20G, within the Office of Naval Communications. While emphasis was on the security of United States military communications, or COMSEC, both organizations developed radio intercept radio direction finding, and processing capabilities prior to World War II. They achieved particular successes against Japanese diplomatic communications, exploitation, successes of their respective counterpart service communications had to await the shift of resources until after hostilities commenced. However, wartime successes by the United States and Britain 
proved the value of comment to military and political leaders. And as a result, both service organizations expanded greatly in terms of manpower, resources, and, of course, equipment. In the later stages of the war, the services created a coordinating body to facilitate comment cooperation. The Army, Navy, Communications Intelligence Board, or ANCIB, known as ANCIB, with a subordinate coordinating committee. ANCICC. These became the instruments for negotiating joint post war arrangements. In late 1945, with the addition of the Department of State to its membership, ANCIB became the State Army Navy Communications Intelligence Board, or STANCIB. STANCIB involved in 1946 into the United States Communications Intelligence Board, or USCIB, USIB, which added the Federal Bureau of Investigation as a member. With the passage of the National Security Act of 1947, Congress reinforced the direction in which the intelligence community was moving toward increased centralization and built the framework for a modern national security structure. Among other things, the Act established the National Security Council, known as the NSC, and the Central Intelligence Agency, CIA. The CIA became a member of USIB, which received a new charter as the highest national comment authority in the form of a National Security Council Intelligence Directive, NSCID No. 9, dated 1 July 1948. As the Air Force sought to expand its cryptologic organization, Secretary of Defense James V. Forrestal contemplated cutting defense expenditures. One solution was a unified cryptologic agency. He appointed a special board under Rear Admiral Earl E. Stone, the Director of Naval Communications, to formulate a plan for merging all military comment and concept activities and resources into a single agency. Only the Army favored the Stone Board's recommendations for merger at this time, and the plan, ladies and gentlemen, was achieved. Excuse me, the plan was shelved, not achieved. Let me read that again. Only the Army favored the Stone Board's recommendations for merger at this time, and the plan was shelved. I got a little ahead of myself. Achieved comes next. In 1949, a new Secretary of Defense, Lewis A. Johnson, also seeking ways to economize, reviewed the Stone Board's report and began to take steps for its implementation. After much discussion among the services regarding the concept of merger, on 20 May 1949, Secretary Johnson ordered the issuance of JCS, that's Joint Chiefs of Staff, Directive 2010. This directive established the Armed Forces Security Agency, or AF. SA, which had as its mission the conduct of communications, intelligence, and communications security activities within the national military establishment. AFSA thus had the actual responsibility for running COMINT and COMSEC operations, excluding only those that were delegated individually to the Army, Navy, and Air Force. The JCS directive also established an advisory council within the AFSA structure known for a time as the Armed Forces Communications Intelligence Advisory Council, or AFCIAC. It later was renamed Armed Forces Security Agency Council, or AFSAC. The organization became the mechanism through which AFSA reported to the JCS. On 15 July 1949, Rear Admiral Stone became AFSA's first director, appointed by the JCS. By January 1950, the Army and Navy cryptologic organizations had transferred enough civilian and military personnel, as well as equipment, so that AFSA could operate. 
AFSA did not, however, have its own facilities. Admiral Stone was succeeded in 1951 by Army Major General Ralph J. Canine. By this time, various difficulties in defining powers and areas of jurisdiction were painfully obvious. Further, both directors experienced grave difficulties in obtaining the Advisory Council's approval of proposed courses of action because of AFSAC's policy requiring unanimous decisions. Finally, the potentialities of expanding technical comment capabilities of the late 1940s could not always be realized. During the Korean War, the quality of strategic intelligence derived from comment fell below that which had been provided in World War II. Consumers were disappointed and increasingly critical. By late 1951, AFSA had clashed with the service cryptologic agencies, with consumers, with the Central Intelligence Agency, and with the State Department, although not all at one time, nor with all on one issue. But despite the intentions, AFSA had in fact become a fourth military cryptologic agency which defeated the entire person, purpose of its creation. On 13 December 1951, President Truman ordered a searching analysis to be conducted by a special committee to be named by the Secretaries of State and Defense, aided by the Director of Central Intelligence. Chaired by George Brownell, an eminent New York lawyer, the Brownell Committee surveyed the situation and in June recommended that a unified COMIT agency receive greater powers commensurate with clearly defined responsibilities. It also advised that the agency be freed of the crippling line of subordination through AFSAC to the JCS and instead be directly subordinate to the Secretary of Defense acting with the Secretary of State on behalf of the National Security Council. It further proposed that the unified agency be controlled in policy matters by a reconstituted USIB under the chairmanship of the Director of Central Intelligence, in which the representation of military and non-military intelligence interests would be evenly balanced. In October 1952, the President and National Security Council adopted most of the Brownells Committee's recommendations and issued a revised version of NSCID No. 9 on 24 October 1952. A mingling of military and non-military interests was expressed in the word national. The production of comment was declared to be a national responsibility. In place of an armed forces security agency, the United States government was to have a national security agency, an organization with the same resources plus a new charter. The AFSA Council, while not specifically abolished, thus had the agency pulled right out from under it. The Joint Chiefs of Staff were no longer in the chain of command. The director of the National Security Agency reported directly to the Secretary of Defense through a unit in the latter's office that dealt with sensitive operations. The Secretary himself was declared to be executive agent of the government for comment and subordinate to a special committee for the National Security Council, of which he and the Secretary of State were the two members and the director of Central Intelligence was merely an advisor. The Secretary of Defense was instructed to delegate his comment responsibilities to the Director of the National Security Agency and to entrust to him operational and technical control of all United States military comment collection and production resources. The Director of the National Security Agency was ordered to bring about the most effective unified application of all United States resources for producing national comment to meet requirements approved by USIB. In addition, the DERNSA, or Director of the National Security Agency, was ordered to assume the ComSec responsibilities previously assigned to AFSA. 
Promulgation of NSCID number 9 brought about a greater participation by civilian members, the Central Intelligence Agency and the State Department, of the community in the comment process. At the same time, it was recognition of the necessity for more centralized technical operations. And on November the 4th, 1952, Major General Ralph J. Canine, United States Army, became the very first director of the National Security Agency. Unlike the Defense Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency is a presidential creation established in response to a top-secret directive issued by President Truman in October of 1952. In this directive, the President designated the Secretary of Defense as Executive Agent for the Signals Intelligence and Communications Security Activities of the Government. A specific National Security Council Intelligence Directive, or NSCID, defines the NSA's functions. It is augmented by the Director of Central Intelligence Directives, DCIDs, and Internal Department of Defense and National Security Agency regulations. The National Security Agency assumed the responsibilities of its predecessor, the Armed Forces Security Agency, or AFSA, also known as AFSA, which had been created after World War II to integrate the national cryptologic effort. The National Security Agency was established as a separate agency, responsible directly to the Secretary of Defense. In addition, it was granted SIGINT, Operational Control, over the three service cryptologic collection agencies, or SCAs, the Army Security Agency, Naval Security Group Command, and Air Force Security Service. Under this arrangement, the National Security Agency encountered initially the same jurisdictional difficulties that were to plague the Defense Intelligence Agency. In an effort to strengthen the influence of the Director of the National Security Agency, known as DERNSA, over their activities, the SCAs were confederated in 1971 under a Central Security Service, also known as CSS, with the DERNSA as its chief. The National Security Agency, Central Security Service, or NSA slash CSS, provides centralized coordination, direction, and control of the government's signals intelligence SIGINTS, and Communications Security COMSEC activities. The Central Security Service, CSS, was established by a presidential memorandum in order to provide a more unified cryptologic effort within the Department of Defense. With the establishment of the CSS, NSA underwent a major internal reorganization to become the institution it is today. As Chief, CSS, the Director of the National Security Agency, exercises control over the signals intelligence activities of the military services. NSA, while not a military organization, is one of several elements of the intelligence community administered by the Department of Defense. The agency was charged with an additional mission, computer security. In a 1984 presidential directive and with an Operation Security Training Mission in a 1988 presidential directive, like the Department of State and Federal Bureau of Investigation, the National Security Agency has its own civilian career service established by Congress in 1959. To maintain this career service, the agency conducts its own recruiting and employment programs. From its beginning, the National Security Agency has been hiring promising college graduates from all sections of the country, including the Baltimore-Washington area, to augment its growing staff of professionals. A major recruiting center of the entire intelligence community is Brigham Young University in Utah. The Secretary of Defense approved the plan for restructuring defense intelligence on 15 March 1991 and subsequently forwarded it to Congress. The plan emphasized the centralization of management within the Department of Defense for more effectively dealing with the changing world situation. However, 
the National Security Agency was only peripherally affected by the plan, under which the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Command, Control, Communications, and Intelligence does not exercise the same degree of control, direction, and authority over the National Security Agency as was instituted for the Defense Intelligence Agency. Most National Security Agency employees, both civilian and military, are headquartered at Fort George G. Meade in Maryland. The rest of the workforce is scattered at continental United States and overseas field locations. The National Security Agency is one of the largest employers in the state of Maryland. Its workforce represents an unusual combination of occupational specialties including engineers, physicists, mathematicians, linguists, and computer scientists. The NSA reportedly has about 20,000 employees in Maryland alone, with a $831.7 million payroll in 1990. This estimate is consistent with the approximately 5 million square feet of National Security Agency office space at Fort Meade, somewhat less than the Pentagon, which houses somewhat more than 20,000 personnel. Other published estimates that the National Security Agency has between 38,000 and 52,000 employees clearly also include the personnel of the Central Security Service military components, as well as contractor personnel. The National Security Agency conducted the most significant upgrade of NSA's facilities in its history. Based on a blueprint, the facility's focus plan prepared and approved in 1989. The 1989 facilities focus plan provided for the upgrading of over 2.5 million square feet of space and will in be involved the movement of over one half of the National Security Agency's workforce. When completed, the NSA will have achieved a long-sought goal of a minimum of 70 square feet of office space per person across the entire National Security Agency. In 1991 alone, the NSA added over 1 million square feet of new space to the NSA inventory by opening the new REE, or RE building, the SPL state-of-the-art microelectronics production facility, the System Processing Center, and the Columbia Annex. These facilities were occupied by thousands of National Security Agency employees. In addition, the total renovation of the headquarters building was 60% complete and the offices were partially reoccupied, providing workspace for another 1,000 plus employees. As the National Security Agency moved people into these new spaces, the areas they leave were fully renovated and other employees moved into expanded spaces, a process the NSA called decompression. In 1992, NSA completed the renovation of SAB-1 for parts of ISL and began the renovations of FANCS-2 for the National Cryptologic School and FANCS-3 for another key component. In addition to executing the facility's focus plan, many other major facilities projects are underway or have been completed. The Twin Towers utility upgrade on the headquarters building provided improved air conditioning for people and equipment. The 3,000 ton chiller plant constructed in front of the headquarters building provided much needed cooling for Ops 1 occupants. The chiller plant's main distribution loop delivers over 430,000 gallons of chilled water per hour to Ops 1. This project required over 200 helicopter airlifts to put equipment in place on the Ops 1 building. The road improvements project provided a much needed upgrade to the road network throughout the NSA headquarters complex. The sprinkler project met the latest fire safety codes. An extensive asbestos removal was conducted in Ops 1 and the headquarters building to provide an asbestos-free environment for NSA's employees.
Ladies and gentlemen, the hour of the time is brought to you, as always, by Swiss America Trading. We specialize in non-confiscatable, non-reportable hard assets. Assets that you're going to need if everything comes to pass that has been predicted, and I guarantee you that it will. I can't tell you exactly when, but I can tell you that it will. For instance, ladies and gentlemen, Robert Rubin has exhausted his sources to steal money from in order to keep the government afloat. He has raided the federal pension funds twice. Totally illegal, totally unlawful, in fact, was threatened with impeachment by several members of Congress if he ever does it again. We know because it was stated, ladies and gentlemen, just day before yesterday on Sunday, by Robert Rubin himself, that if an agreement isn't reached on the budget by the 28th of February, the United States government will default on March the 1st. If that happens, the dollar will plummet and the stock market is sure to crash. Do you want to take a chance of losing everything that you own because you failed to make a telephone call and take the proper steps to prepare? You see, because if that happened, it would be the long-awaited economic catastrophe that would allow the president to declare a state of national emergency and declare martial law. The rest, I'm sure, you are fully capable of imagining. So call our sponsor, Swiss America Trading, at 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Thank them for sponsoring this broadcast. Tell them that you're a steady listener to the hour of the time, and you'll get red carpet treatment, I assure you. And do, ladies and gentlemen, what a responsible person should do. You must at least protect a portion of your assets. And there is only one, one commodity in the history of the world that can do that. It's known as real money, gold and silver coin. 1-800-289-2646. And do it now. You know how you are. You're just like me. I tend to procrastinate sometimes. And so do you. So call now. 
included the installation of additional landscaping and efforts to repaint and clean up the corridors prior to President Bush's visit in 1991, along with the addition of a marble signpost at the intersection of Route 32 and K-9 Road, and the redecorating of the Ops 2B lobby, all of which were intended to create a dignified and professional look at the National Security Agency. Who they wanted to impress is anybody's guess, because nobody but them are ever allowed inside. But some workspaces remained overcrowded and unattractive, with some offices working under such crowded conditions that everyone in each row must interrupt their work to move each time a teamwork teammate enters or exits the aisle. Workspace requirements and safety regulations were not complied with. In 1991, the National Security Agency planners anticipated possible personnel and operations and maintenance budget cuts and began planning for reduced lease, utility, and facility support costs commensurate with projected budget reductions. The NSA drawdown plan was approved by the Critical Issues Group, the current board of directors, in January 1992, briefed to and approved by Dernsa in February 1992, and presented to and approved by several congressional staffs in March of 1992. This plan's strategy focused on the reduction of nine leased buildings. This would not only decrease rent and utility costs, but also such facility support costs as security grounds, maintenance, bus service, mail runs, and local travel time. Another major goal of the plan is to accommodate the 1992 NSA agency restructure by consolidating several key components into fewer buildings, bringing many of the elements in closer proximity to the National Security Agency headquarters at Fort Meade and enhancing the efficiency of signet resources and support services. The technology and systems organization will be housed in NBP-1 Research and Electronics and Kanks, C-A-N-X. Operations elements are to be consolidated at the Fort Meade complex. Several support services elements will be relocated to the Ops 3 and APS-20 buildings, and the Information Systems Security Organization will be consolidated in Thanks 3 and in Ops 3. Over the course of the four-year implementation, the drawdown plan will affect 21 National Security Agency-owned or leased buildings. Over 1.2 million square feet 
will be involved, and 506 organizations, ranging from 10 to 200 people, will be moved. The plan comprises more than 1,700 activities, ranging from building designs and construction to furniture and communications installation to the actual organizational moves. The plan is further complicated by over 3,000 constraints or dependent activities. Constraints are activities that must precede or succeed one another. Therefore, if one activity is delayed, it can delay another activity, which in turn delays two more activities, which in turn delays several more activities, and so on and so on ad dominicos. These constraints, combined with the large volume of work to be accomplished, are what make this plan so complex. From the beginning, the drawdown plan assumed an aggressive schedule. However, since the original plan was devised, two major changes have occurred. The first involved a key aspect of the plan, the leasing of NBP-1. Prior to the 1992 NSA reorganization, the building had been completely designed for its new occupants, the majority of whom were coming directly from the Ops 1, Ops 2B, and APS 20 buildings. However, as a result of the agency reorganization, the slated occupants of the building completely changed. Elements from throughout the National Security Agency were scheduled to move to NBP-1, home of the New Technology and Systems Organization. And this meant that the floor plans, seating arrangements, communication systems, etc., had to be readjusted. The drawdown team was able to rectify the situation with no delay to the already tight schedule. The second major alteration involved the relocation of the Naval Security Group, NSC, from its Nebraska Avenue headquarters to Ops 3, a direct result of the Federal Base Closure Act. Prior to the decision to relocate NSG, Fanks 3 was scheduled to be rehabbed floor by floor over the course of three years. However, because DDI personnel must vacate their Ops 3 spaces to make room for the 1995 arrival of NSG, the rehab of Fanks 3, DDI's new home, must be completed in 18 months. This aggressive schedule requires that the entire Fanks 3 building be empty during the rehab. The drawdown plan had to be altered to allow for temporary retention of ITB and indefinite retention of APS-20 to accommodate the FANX-3 personnel. This major revision did not lengthen the original four-year drawdown schedule. The National Security Agency drawdown plan includes the termination of leases for FANX-1, APS-8, and APS-9, the complete renovation and occupancy of FANX-2, the consolidation of the National Cryptologic School in FANX 2, the consolidation of the operations organization in the headquarters complex, and the transfer of all personnel from FANX 3 in preparation of the building rehab with scheduled to be completed by mid-1995. Equally significant is the complete interior construction and occupancy of NBP-1 when leased in 1992, NBP-1 was essentially a hollow building. Crews had to construct everything from floors and ceilings to heating and air conditioning systems to communication lines and sprinkler systems to walls and furniture. By late 1996, the plan's scheduled completion date, the National Security Agency will fully reoccupy the newly renovated Banks 3 and termination of leases for Parkway Center, APS 5, APS 10, APS 11, APS 13, and the International Tower Building. The implementation of the National Security Agency Space Drawdown Plan required the combined efforts of many organizations. The Support Services Organization for Design, Construction, Maintenance, Custodial, Transportation, Furnishings, and Security Operations. The Army Corps of Engineers for Project Lease Management. The Technology and Systems Organization for Communication Spit-Up and Support. The Plans, Policy, and Programs Organization for Financial Programming and Budgeting. All of these organizations keep records, make reports, and have to answer to Congress 
for their expenditures. So, for an agency that's supposed to be so super secret, it was not hard for the intelligence service to accumulate, analyze, and compile all of this information. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're wondering how difficult it was, it was just time consuming. Just think what the Russians must have. Focusing on quality customer support, the Space Drawdown Plan tries to minimize the inconvenience to the National Security Agency personnel as much as possible. Other than the time required to pack and unpack, moves are completed overnight with minimal office downtime. Whenever possible, customers may retain their telephone numbers at their new location. And although double and sometimes triple moves are occasionally necessary, the team takes great pains not to hopscotch their customers all over the agency. The National Security Agency Space Drawdown Plan is a team effort requiring the coordination of many different agency elements, which will continue until the final move is completed in late 1996. Fort George G. Meade at Fort Meade, Maryland. Fort Meade's mission is to provide a wide range of support to 56 tenant organizations from all four services and to several federal agencies. Major tenants include the National Security Agency, NSA, the United States Army Intelligence and Security Command, the Naval Security Group Activity, and the 694th Intelligence Wing of the United States Air Force. Fort George G. Meade, Maryland is an Army installation dedicated to providing support to servicemen, women, Department of Defense civilians, and their families. It's located midway between the cities of Baltimore, Washington, D.C., and Annapolis, near the communities of Odenton, Laurel, and Columbia. The installation lies four miles east of Interstate 95 and one half mile east of the Baltimore Washington Parkway between Maryland State Routes 175 and 198. Fort Meade is home to approximately 9,200 military personnel, as well as 29,000 civilian employees. Approximately 7,500 family members also reside on post. The economic impact of Fort Meade to local civilian communities is approximately $2 billion annually. Now, this reaches the community in the form of $300 million in military payroll, $1.2 billion in civilian payroll, and nearly $500 million in local contracts. Virtually a city in itself, Fort Meade has 65 miles of paved roads and 28 miles of secondary roads and 1,670 buildings. There's also a bank, a modern exchange mall, credit union, post office, hospitals, chapels, and many other facilities. Fort George G. Meade became an Army installation in 1917, authorized by an act of Congress in May 1917. It was, in fact, one of 16 cantonments built for troops drafted for the war with the Central Powers in Europe. The present Maryland site was selected on June the 23rd, 1917. Actual construction began in July. The first contingent of troops arrived here that September. The post was originally named Camp Meade for Major General George Gordon Meade, whose defensive strategy at the Battle of Gettysburg proved a major factor in turning the tide of the Civil War in favor of the North. During World War I, more than 100,000 men passed through Fort Meade, a training site for three infantry divisions, three training battalions, and one depot brigade. Source of this information? Fort Meade Public Affairs Office. In 1928, when the post was renamed Fort Leonard Wood, Pennsylvanians registered such a large protest that the installation was permanently named Fort George G. Meade on 5 March, 1929. This action was largely the result of a rider attached to the regular Army Appropriation Act by a member of the House of Representatives from the Keystone State. Fort Meade became a training center during World War II. Its ranges and other facilities were used by more than 200 units and approximately 3,500,000 men between 1942 
1946. The wartime peak military personnel figure at Fort Meade was reached in March 1945, which was 70,000. With the conclusion of World War II, Fort Meade reverted to routine peacetime activities, but later returned to build-up status. Many crises, including Korea, West Berlin, and Cuba, along with Vietnam-related problems, were to come. One key post-World War II event at Fort Meade was the transfer of the 2nd United States Army Headquarters from Baltimore on 15 June 1947. This transfer brought an acceleration of post-activity because 2nd Army Headquarters exercised command over Army units throughout a then seven-state area. A second important development occurred on 1 January 1966 when the 2nd United States Army merged with the 1st United States Army. The consolidated headquarters moved from Fort J, New York to Fort Meade to administer activities of Army installations in a 15-state area. In August 1990, Fort Meade began processing Army Reserve and National Guard units from several states for the presidential call-up in support of Operation Desert Shield. In addition to processing reserve and National Guard units, Fort Meade sent two active duty units, the 85th Medical Battalion and the 519th Military Police Battalion to Saudi Arabia. In all, approximately 2,700 personnel from 42 units deployed from Fort Meade during Operation Desert Shield Desert Storm. The National Security Agency was established by Presidential Directive on 4 November 1952. In 1957, the National Security Agency consolidated its headquarters operations at Fort George G. Meade, Maryland, and its headquarters complex at Fort Meade is dominated by two high-rise buildings completed in 1986 and dedicated by then-President Ronald Reagan in a special ceremony. The complex includes an operations building, a technical library, and other facilities which house logistics and support activities. The National Security Agency is supported by elements of the Army, Navy, Marines, and Air Force, whose officers and enlisted personnel constitute approximately 20% of the agency workforce. The remainder are civilians who are permanently assigned and who reside in the Baltimore, Washington area. A large number of the agency's semi-skilled and clerical employees have been drawn from the local area. The NSA has developed special educational programs in conjunction with local high schools to help prepare students for employment with the agency. The National Security Agency works with U.S. employment offices and civic groups in the area to promote employment of the handicapped. Graduates coming from high schools and college campuses may move into one of three broadly defined professional occupational areas. Some specialize in cryptology, making and testing United States codes and ciphers. Others become specialists in the data processing fields, and the remainder, especially mathematicians, scientists, and engineers, will work in research and development. The National Security Agency has always placed great emphasis on the training and development of its people. The establishment of the National Cryptologic School as a separate professional structure is a true symbol of this concern and represents further enhancement of the agency's already extensive training activities. Additionally, the agency has a number of educational programs, both undergraduate and graduate, established with the Johns Hopkins University, American University, George Washington University, University of Maryland, and Catholic University, as well as its own special courses. Also, a number of NSA professional personnel teach part-time at these local universities. Gunter Arendt's list of the world's most powerful computing sites shows the National Security Agency at Fort Meade as the world's second most powerful supercomputer. This listing ranks sites according to ratings, which are ratios to a Cray Y-MPI based on NASA NPB-BT size A benchmark reports. They denote approximations 
usually based on comparable programs. Figures suffix with a question mark denote relative guesses based on Intel Paragon peak deflops ratios. Installed at Fort George Meade are one Cray T3D MC1024-8, four Cray C916-161024, five Cray J916-161024, one TMC CM-5-256-128, Six Cray Y dash M P eight E slash eight one zero two four one Cray T ninety four slash forty one twenty eight one SRC T E R A S Y S one Cray three slash S S S and probably an awful lot that is not known to anyone except those specifically assigned to those computers. We will continue tomorrow night and the night after and the night after until we're completed with this report. Ladies and gentlemen, good night and God bless each and every single one of you. Peter Temple was in reality a mass mind control experiment conducted by the CIA as a follow up to something called MK Ultra. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.